Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming for the lecture on this rainy day. And uh, thanks to Feng Yen, who's accepted the invitation and who has prepared uh, the lecture on cancer and how to fight cancer God's way. We're excited to have you here. And please take your seats uh, as we are about to start. And let's bow our heads for the opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for the rain and we ask for your Holy Spirit to rain on our hearts as well, to prepare them for your kingdom. And we ask for your rich blessings um, through this lecture. Please help us to receive your blessings and to take lessons for our lives. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming uh, to join me this, uh, to talk about how to fight cancer God's way. Uh, I don't know how, how many of you know, but I actually didn't know until I was doing the lecture, preparing my slides, that uh, this month is actually Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, so it's very appropriate that we are gonna talk about how we can fight cancer. Um, so for those of you who don't know about me, <laughs> just wanted to share a little bit. I am a PhD scientist and I have been studying uh, about the molecular biology of cancer ever since I was in high school actually. Uh, I've been doing research on it. <laughs> and for my PhD, I actually teamed up with my husband and discovered a disease called X-Men disease um, in these two, initially in these two boys, but we found other people who had the disease. But it's a genetic disease where they had a mutation um, that made them more susceptible to getting um, uh, basically getting a, a cancer that's uh, triggered by a virus called EBV, Epstein-Barr virus. It's a virus that actually many of us have. Um, it's the virus that causes mono, um, and, but it doesn't actually cause cancer. Oh, most of us don't get cancer from it because we have a good immune system, but these kids have an impaired immune system because of the genetic defect that they had. And as a result of that, they are more susceptible to getting high levels of EBV in their body. And it, as that chronic EBV infection um, keeps on building up, over time they are more susceptible to getting a cancer from it. Um, the happy ending to the story is that we actually also discovered a way to treat the disease by doing a magnesium supplementation, which helped them bring their EBV levels down. And as a result of that, it makes them less susceptible to developing the, the cancer down the road. So that was a, a really happy ending to that story. And uh, I'm happy to share it, and you can ask my husband more about this, the story. <laughs> but this is a YouTube video. You're happy to. You're welcome to go online and just Google X-Men disease, and you'll, you can learn more about it. Um, so why do we care about cancer? I, I think many of you probably are aware that cancer is actually the second leading cause of death in our nation. Um, I mean, you can raise your hands. Who knows somebody who has cancer, or had cancer, or died from cancer? We we'll probably get hands from everybody, right? Um, I think the statistics is something like, you know, every one in two men probably will develop cancer in their lifetime, or and I think one in three women. So it's it's very very common, and you know, you're you're very likely. <laughs> most of us will are likely to get a cancer, or we will know somebody who actually will get a cancer. Um, so it's very serious disease, and we ought to uh, really pay a lot of attention to it. Um, it's only you know behind uh, heart disease by just a teeny little bit, and it's probably you know unlike heart disease, which is I think fairly stable or decreasing in incidence, um, cancer is actually growing in uh, in prevalence in a, in our country. So um, it's a disease that you know you don't think about it until you have it, and you don't think that you're going to get it until you have it, and so it kind of creeps up on you, and you we ought to think about it before we get it. What is cancer? So uh, I like to just broaden out my talk a little bit so that I don't like to assume everybody know what is cancer. Um, so cancer is basically an uncontrolled growth of cells. Um, cells is what makes up our, our body. And normally, most of the cells in our body are, do not divide abnormally. Um, cancer happens when the cells start dividing, when they're not supposed to be dividing, and they grow out of control. Um, 
just to illustrate a little bit about you know what makes up our cells. Cells is the building box of all all human, I mean all living things, pretty much. Um, God made cells with very intricate, you know, intricate um, parts inside of cells. Um, just want to describe a little bit about, you know, inside cells we have uh, a nucleus that holds our DNA. DNA is a genetic material that just gives a program for, you know, how uh, to express the ge our, our ge genes and make us who we are. Um, and then you also have these little parts called ribosomes that actually takes, you know, basically takes the DNA and expresses, makes protein out of the DNA. And I know many of us often like to ask, like, oh, where do you get protein? You know, if you don't eat any meat, <laughs> you get protein. The truth is, like, we make protein. You know, our cells, all the cells in our body make protein. They just take amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins, and, you know, chain them up using the genetic, using DNA. Um, you only really need um, about, like, you make most of the amino acids actually in your body. You only need about eight amino acids that are not made in your body, and you can get most of those just from plant foods. So, um, you know, just to show that this is a very regulated process in our body. The cells in our body, you know, they make genetic material and they grow when they're supposed to go, and it's a very regulated process inside our cells. Our genetic material provides all that information. Um, however, cancer happens when that process is gone, you know, gone wrong. And these are some of the hallmarks that scientists have identified as, you know, things that have gone wrong inside cells and that that causes cancer to happen. Um, for example, cancers have, uh, cancer cells have a way of resisting cell death. They have mutations that allow them to, um, you know, they're all apoptosis where cells are programmed to die when they're not, you know, functioning normally. And cancer cells have a way of resisting that, that they, such that they're not dying when they're supposed to die. Um, and, you know, oops, I'm gonna go back. Press the wrong button. <laughs> um, they also deregulate the cellular energetics. You know, they're not using the energy that like, they're supposed to. They're, uh, you know, they have the they produce these signals that tells the cells to grow when they're not, you know, supposed to producing those signals to, when they're not supposed to grow. Um, they also um, there's also signals that suppress growth and they will evade those signals. Like cancer cells will produce signals to evade the suppression. And the immune system also plays a strong role in suppressing cancers as well. And cancer cells also come up with ways to evade the detection from the uh, immune system to that it would, uh, normally would kill off these cancer cells. And um, what else in here? They also um, basically, and so enabling replicative Immortality is basically, um, there is something called telomeres in our cells. Basically, telomeres is like a part in our DNA that gets shorter and shorter as the cell divides. And eventually, you know, if it, the telomeres get so much so short, the cell would no longer be able to divide. But, so that, so this allows, you know, basically doesn't make all cells immortal. But cancer cells as a way of actually, you know, prolonging those telomeres so that it becomes immortal. Like it can keep on dividing without stopping. Um, Inflammation is also a big part of cancer cells. They, they, inflammation is a word that we hear a lot in, you know, in, um, uh, in the news. But basically, if you, uh, it's, it's basically uh, your immune cells coming in and creating a lot of, um, you know, noise and, and causing, basically promoting the tumor growth. Inflammation is not a good thing. Um, and ultimately, the, the, when the cancer cell grows you know, large enough, or a large amount of the cells grow enough, they also de uh, develop uh, the ability to go outside of their, you know, the location where they're actually growing. It's something called metastasis, so go into other parts of the body. Um, that's something, it's a function that they also eventually gain. Um, they also have a way of avoiding angiogenesis. So angiogenesis is basically means that they're, it's a blood supply to, every, you know, every cell in the body needs blood supply. So angiogenesis is a way of grading, growing new blood vessels. So cancer cells have a way of actually, you know, inducing that growth of new blood vessels so that actually gets this blood supply to, to actually allow it to grow. Um, but the, fundamentally, at the very bottom, what's wrong with a cancer cell is something called genomic instability. So genomic instability basically means that it, the cell keeps on accumulating mutations. Um, so in order for a cancer cell to like, you know, keep on, de come, you know, coming up ways to like, you know, keep on growing, keep on doing what it needs to do, it has to keep on mutating its gene 
so that it actually comes up with ways to evade, um, you know, to do all these things that it's not supposed to do. Um, and we're going to talk about what causes actually this genomic instability and the mutations in a second. Um, so the, the question is actually is like, you know, why do we, why do we get cancer, right? Um, and I can tell you that like, you know, from a scientific perspective, we scientists like to focus on the genes. You know, it's, it's in their genes, like it's you blame it on your parents, you got it because you, you, your parents gave you bad genes, right? That's, you know, that's probably true to a certain extent, not really, because all of us basically had mutation. We have mutation in our body basically from the many generations we have lived in, in a sinful world that the mutations accumulate as, as people, you know, as that time goes. Um, so we all have mutations that predis predispose us to diseases like cancer. And, but that doesn't, that by itself is not sufficient to give you cancer. Um, because it's also the environment that you're exposed to that drives, gives you the additional uh, factors that really drive that genomic instability, the mutations to accumulate for you to, for the cell to actually become cancerous. So some of those factors that we see are up here are, you know, uh, environmental toxins, smoking, alcohol, um, your diet, having a very poor diet, um, and having sedentary lifestyle, weakened immune system, uh, obesity, and type 2 diabetes has been associated with cancer, and oxidative stress is a big one. Actually, you probably have heard a lot about oxidative stress, but basically it's what creates what, what we call reactive oxygen species, and those are what actually can get into your DNA and induce mutations in your DNA. So that's one of the biggest drivers of actually, uh, you know, genomic instability and creating, letting allowing cells to become cancerous. Um, so let's talk about how we treat cancer in modern medicine today. What are some of, you know, when you go to your doctor, what, did, what does your doctor tell you, you know, to do to try and prevent cancer? Anybody want to share, like, I'm sorry? Some, say it again. Chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is a treatment. Uh, what do you do? What do they tell you to do to try and prevent cancer? Stop smoking. Okay, that's, that's a good one, yes. Because we, most doctors will tell you, like, don't smoke because that's associated with cancer. Yes. Have a what? A good diet. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's, what, do, what do they mean by good diet? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, that's actually a little unusual. I don't usually hear that when I go to the, even. I mean, uh, when I go to the doctor, they don't usually talk about your diet. <laughs> they usually, well, talk about what get, you know, what makes money, right? <laughs> and what makes money is early screening for cancer, right? Have you heard of early cancer screening? Like, what are some of those tests that they may ask you to do to try and screen for cancer? Mammograms. That's a good one. Yeah, that's how you get an annual mammogram. Um, any other ones that everybody know about? Huh? That's not a standard, I was screening method. They might be for, you know, certain families that have a known history of, like, you know, a, a certain type of cancer that's caused by, that's associated with a certain type of mutation. They will ask you to, yeah, you're probably at risk for it, so you should screen for it, you know. But generally, in the general population, we don't, it just, there's too many mutations. There are different kind of mutations. They can't just ask everybody to go and screen for the same mutation because that would be a very costly test, you know. If there's only a small, my new individuals who have to actually have that mutation, so it's not a high yield test. But some of the common cancer screening tests are mammograms, pap smears, um, uh, colonoscopies, right? I mean, you know, maybe some of you were not old enough to actually get to that age to actually do colonoscopies yet. But but it's 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 when you're old enough, they'll, you'll be doing colonoscopies every ten years. Or um, so those are screening methods to try and look for early signs of cancer. Earlier screen? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's a good slide, huh? Um, did you get it? Okay. Um, so, so these screening methods, you know, they, they are uh, um, there are ways to try and detect, you know, find early signs of what looks like cancer. And, you know, because you wanted to find it and, I guess, find it and, 
it's not really prevention, but it really to treat it early. Um, and if you have a good doctor, they might also mention a few other things like, you know, should I eat healthy, try to be active, try to maintain a healthy weight. You know, that's a very non, <laughs> not very precise uh, way of, I, I feel like those are not, not very precise things to do. They just tell you these are goals that you need to reach, right? You know, to try to be smoke free and not limit alcohol use. Um, what are some of the treatments? I mean, we already heard like chemotherapy. What are some of the treatments that you know they they'll advise you to get if you do have cancer? Surgery. That's right. Any any other one? Anybody else know about? Radiation. Yeah. So those are the top three: surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. Surgery is usually what they resort to when they find a cancer that's fairly localized; it hasn't spread throughout your body yet, so they can just cut it out. Um, Radiation is similar, I mean, it's sort of targeted. So you want to target, you're sending, um, you know, radiation to the area where the cancer is and trying to kill off all the cells that are cancerous. Re chemotherapy is, is the big one that they resort to um, once the cancer has spread or they suspect that it has may have spread, they will ask you to do chemotherapy because it's systemic. They're basically giving you very toxic drugs to try and kill off the cancer cells, fairly non-specifically. Um, they're just you know, very toxic drugs. And that, that's why people, cancer patients usually get, feel very sick because they're not specific. They'll kill off normal, they'll kill off normal cells too. Um, it's all about how much you can tolerate uh, to resist that, uh, that drug so that you, you, if you have enough, uh, if you can tolerate the toxin enough, you can kill off the cancer cells and still have to be alive by the end of it to actually come back. Um, however, uh, the problem with these treatments is that they don't necessarily get rid of the underlying cause that's driving the cancer. It, it really, there's no, it doesn't, you know, uh, there's, it doesn't really uh, make sure that the cancer doesn't come back. A lot of times you'll see the, they'll get rid of the cancer, but they'll come back, you know, five years down the road. Um, and the other uh, caveat for this, for these types of treatment is that you know, the survival rate really depends on how early you catch the cancer. Um, you have to catch it really early, then your chances of survival are higher, because um, then they'll do, they'll do surgery, cut it out. Um, and the, but if you get a very advanced stage cancer, you know, your, your chance of survival is not, it's not very effective. You know, these treatments are not very effective at treating advanced cancers. Um, and the cost for the treatment is also increases as the, more, as the cancer gets more advanced. So. What I'm trying to say is that, like, you know, if you're just relying on modern medicine to help you prevent or treat cancer, you're not, it's not really going to be sustainable or it's not really that effective. Um, which is why I wanted to talk about why we should try and learn to fight cancer God's way. Um, I wanted to, I mean, for those of you who don't know uh, who Ellen White is, she is a woman back in, um, um, she lived in the, you know, during the 1800s to 19, early 1900s. Um, she's been recognized as Smithsonian as one of the 100 most significant Americans of all time. Um, she actually had a third grade education and got an injury in her face that basically didn't allow her to study. But yet she became one of the most prolific woman writers of all time because we believe that she had inspiration from God. If you, you can go and read her autobiography. Um, she had inspiration from God, and that, that led her to write a lot of things that God wants us to know, and in, including leading us to understand the Bible. And she wrote this very important book called The Ministry of Healing that talked about, you know, um, some of these health principles that really help us to fight diseases of our day and age. Um, so now I'm going to go through these eight laws of health that she presented in that book, um, as well as how they tied in with the Bible and how they help us to uh, fight cancer. So there's a good acronym for these eight laws of health. This is a uh, new start. Um, and the N is for nutrition. Um, in Genesis 1.29, God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed and to you it shall be for food. So it's very clearly laid out in Genesis that God created us to eat plant foods. Um, and because these are the most healthy foods for us. And so what he, you know, what he basically tells us to eat is basically whole plant foods. Um, and this is what we call the power play um, because it has whole grains, it has legumes, 
vegetables, fruits, and nuts. You know, those are the foods that we should all strive to eat as, as much as possible. Um, and what I wanted to tell you about is the anti-cancer anti diet is you wanted to avoid foods that really drives cancer. Um, this includes meat, dairy, eggs, barbecue foods, fry foods, smoke foods, um, as well as oil, sugar, processed foods, and refined foods. I would say the higher up this list, the more important it is to, to avoid these things. Um, you know, there's, I've heard a statistic such that um, if you look at barbecue steaks, it's eating one barbecue steak is equivalent to like smoking 200 cigarettes of, in terms of carcinogens that you're getting putting into your body. So that's uh, one example, I think, of, uh, of of uh, why we should avoid uh, a lot of these foods on this list. And in terms of foods that we need to eat um, to try to help us fight cancer, it's, again, it's really your veggies, fruits, whole grains, legumes, and nuts in moderation because it's high in fat. Um, and spices, something that we don't think about a lot, but spices is, is extremely, uh, has a, lots of vital nutrients that help us to fight cancer that most of us don't eat a lot of. Um, and it's, I would, strongly encourage um, once you use, you know transition to using more spices instead of salts for seasoning it's it's a good way to get more of these nutrients that help us to fight cancer and other diseases and uh, and in this diet I would also recommend that you take uh, take these two vitamin uh, supplements if you're not like for b12 it's a it's a vitamin that you found that's actually made by a bacteria in dirt. So unless you're going out to garden every day or you're you're, you're actually eating fortified foods such as uh, nutritional yeast flakes or uh, soy milk every day on a daily basis, uh, you, you know, you try to take a supplement. You can take um, 250 micrograms per day or 2,500 per week. I like the per week because it's a lot easier to remember. Uh, but, and you can also, you can get it really cheaply from Costco. I think it's like they have the 5,000 micrograms and you can buy like a bottle that lasts you like six years for like $18 or something. It's like really dirt cheap. Um, and the other one is vitamin D and I'll talk about it in a little bit why you need to take vitamin D. Um, I read, uh, and I'll show you, it also, uh, you can also go on nutritionfacts.org that tells you like how much vitamin D to take. Um, but in general, you wanted to strive to eat as much foods from the nutrition rainbow, like, you know, that are colorful as possible. This is a, actually a diagram from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Manner, which is an organization that I work for, um, as well as Hannah. And, uh, you know, this tells you, like, every color has, I'm sorry, this is hard to read, <laughs> has nutrients that are important for fighting cancer. So as you, you should try to eat foods as much from every different color as possible, because that's, that's gonna help you, uh, give you those extra nutrients uh, that you need to help fight cancer cells. And now I'm gonna show a, a video from nutritionfacts.org um, that talks about, you know, what is the best advice on diet and cancer? Um, Marcus, can you play the video? So while he's trying to get it to work, I just wanna mention that nutritionfacts.org is a nonprofit um, started by a doctor who is very passionate about using diet and lifestyle to help people uh, treat their chronic diseases. And so he's kind of perused through like all the nutrition literature, uh, all the scientific literature that's to, to look for evidence to tell us, you know, what we should do about changing our life. Like what are the best supported evidence for what changes in our lifestyles that we need to make to uh, to reverse or fight these chronic diseases. I'll just quickly summarize that by basically um, he's talking about the, um, you know, the Chronic American... Chronic diseases unique. Uh, the big organizations that basically, American Cancer Society or the big organizations that actually give us advice about cancers and they've really, you know, come up with, uh, they come out to say that the scientific evidence supports that we shouldn't be eating meat or processed meat because it's can't, it's basically carcinogenic just like t tobacco is. Um, however, they still get a lot of, you know, pushbacks from the meat industry that tells that tells them, that, like, why are you doing this? Like, why are you actually telling us? <laughs> you shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't be saying, telling the public not to eat meat and, th and things like of that sort. So um, at the end of the day, what he's saying is really backing up what I said earlier, that, you know, the, the best diet for, you, for, for cancer patients and for if you want to fight cancer is to eat a whole food plant-based plant -based diet. 
And it, interestingly, Ellen White once wrote that cancerous tumors and pulmonary diseases are largely caused by meat eating. You know, this is a woman who wrote this more than 100 years ago. You know, and now we're getting, you know, we're having the evidence to support that that is completely true. Um, and just further support that, you know, she got, she, it's, she didn't write this because, you know, she knew she, she was, uh, you know, she was making this up. She actually wrote this because she had the inspiration. God told her that, and so she wrote this down to have, to warn us. So uh, what he's saying is that there is a strong association between handling chicken and can getting pancreatic cancer and liver cancer. Um, and I think it's very interesting that Ellen White once said, you know, this really backs up what Ellen White once said, that from the light of God has given me, uh, the prevalence of cancers and tumors is largely due to gross living on dead, on dead flesh. Um, she knew about, you know, that these uh, animal food, not only is not unhealthy to eat, it's, it's also unhealthy to handle because there's viruses around and those viruses can cause cancers. Not only viruses, but probably the others, other, you know, uh, infectious agents um, that we don't know about. Um, so the next law of health that I want to talk about is exercise. Uh, I think we hear a lot about exercise. Doctors always tell us exercise. Uh, I think it's uh, just, you know, we, we, we have a lot of evidence to back up, you know, why we should exercise. And I think it's interesting that God created us. When he created us in Genesis 2.15, he said um, that the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So he he made us to work in the garden of Eden to 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 do active physical work. Um, and now I'm going to watch a video from nutritionfacts.org that talks about how how exercise can help us fight cancer or you know how effective it is for fighting cancer. Can you play it? So I think you, if you didn't get the message, basically what he's saying is exercise certainly helps you to fight cancer cells. Um, but you know, if you eat a horrible diet, it's not, you, you, it's not as effective, or you're not going to need to work a lot harder <laughs> to try and overcome that horrible diet to fight cancer cells. So you know, he was saying the people who were eating a healthy diet, like a whole food, plant based diet, they were they don't need to do as even they were doing like little exercise, just walking. You know, a lot of us can walk. It's not that bad of an exercise. They did still did better than people who were doing hardcore exercise. So. Not that it doesn't help. Torquard exercise, you definitely see an effect. It does have, make the cancer cells die, but it's just not as effective as eating a healthy diet. So this actually, and I, there's vid other videos on nutritionfacts.org that helps you, t you know, I hope this is as an encouragement for helping to eating healthier. Um, it basically tells you how much you need to exercise based on what you eat. <laughs> and, you know, maybe the next time you think about twice about eating that potato chip because every chip can, can tell you that you need to go and actually run 10 minutes or 20 minutes. And you know, just ask yourself if you wanted to do the do the exercise to overcome to compensate for that what you're eating, um, as a way to like overcome your you know your temptations of being of eating that unhealthy healthy food. So the third law is water. Um, in Genesis two ten, God said, "Now the river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became the river heads." You know, God certainly created uh, fresh water in our land as a way to uh, bring up, uh, uh, you know, living things and help us to live. And if you look at how much water is in our body, it's, you know, a little baby is like 75% water. <laughs> Sorry, it's hard to see that, actually. There's a, it's easier to see on my screen, actually. Um, and a little ch a children's are 65% water. And adults, females are 55%, and then I think adult males are 60% water. So we're mostly made of water. We need water. Um, how much water would, do we need to drink? Um, a quick, quick rule of thumb is actually take your weight divided by two, and then that's the amount of ounces that you should be drinking per day. Um, you can divide that by eight to get yourself, you know, get a sense of how many cups you need, you need to drink um, per day to, to reach the minimum amount of water that you need to eat. I mean, this is just the amount of water that you need to drink to uh, account for the waste that you're you're losing the water that you're losing through like peeing and sweating and whatnot. Um, you know, if you're exercising and sweating a lot more, you probably should be drinking more than that. Um, and what to drink and not to drink. Um, that's actually, this is probably the more critical point that I want to emphasize for 
for cancer. Um, the water that we drink today is very contaminated and there's a lot of toxins. So I think it's very important that we should find a clean source of water to drink. Um, I only give this as one example of a water filter that I use. Um, this is actually a water filter that um, alkalinizes water, but it also act, um, actually adds antioxidants to the water. So potentially it could help you fight oxidative stress and, uh, um, uh, and you know, anything of that's uh, tr triggering cancer cells to become cancerous. Um, but what's more important probably is also to avoid drinking drinks that actually has sugar, uh, lots of, you know, sugar in it. Uh, pretty much all soft drinks or any drinks that you, we have out there that's sold commercially is, has sugar <laughs> in it. So it's important that we choose drinks that do not have sugar or has very limited amount of sugar because uh, cancer cells do love sugar, especially processed sugar. Um, so the fourth law that I want to talk about is sunshine. Um, in Genesis 1.16, God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So he made the great light, which is sunshine, um, for, for a very important reason for us because he knows that we need it for our health. Um, and scientifically, we know these days um, your sunshine is very important for our bodies to make vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D is a very important vitamin, and this is actually one study that shows that, you know, people, depending on um, how much vitamin D that people have, oh, actually, these are actually a supplement study, like people who supplement with vitamin D, um, 1,100 international units per day, um, compared to people who supplement either only with calcium or not, with, with some placebo pill, they are less likely to um, get cancer, or the fraction that's remaining cancer-free is a lot higher. So there's, you're li like less likely to get cancer if you're actually getting your vitamin D. So that brings me to the point earlier, that if you're not actually outside getting at least 20 to 30 minutes of sunshine a day, and if you have darker skin, you probably need to stay out longer, um, you need to be taking the vitamin D supplement. Um, Nutritionfacts.org recommend 2,000 international units per day. Um, and I should also recommend that you just try and look for a vegan <laughs> source of vitamin D because I a lot of times these days they make vitamin D actually get get it from like pork skin or something. I mean that's like very for me is could be very contaminated. You don't know. You know it's better to get a source that is actually from a plant. Um, um, and the other reason that we need vitamin D is actually also to make a very important hormone that I'll talk about later too at night. Uh, but sunshine is actually used in our body to create something called serotonin. Serotonin is a happy mood hormone, so that's why we, we're happy when we're in the sunshine. Um, so that's, that's made during the day, um, and it's made using, you know, tryptophan, which actually comes from foods like tofu and other uh, plant, plant sources. And, um, and when that is made at nighttime when you sleep, this serotonin is being converted using magnesium and zinc to uh, another very important hormone called melatonin. And melatonin is actually known as the most powerful antioxidant on earth. It's about like, I think a hundred times more, more powerful than like, you know, blue, the antioxidants that you find, blueberry or, um, so if you're not getting your melatonin, you're actually missing out on a very important source of, uh, you know, internal, uh, very important source of, uh, of, of uh, antioxidants that will help us fight cancer. So, the fifth law is temperance. Um, this, uh, in Genesis 2, 16 to 17, and the Lord commanded man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge and good and evil uh, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So this just shows that, like, you know, God knows what's good for our body. And he tells us, like, you know, to avoid certain things that we shouldn't be eating. Um, and so this, there's a lot of toxic stuff in our, in our environment these days. And I'm just, you know, this is just some examples of things that are uh, toxic in our environment and that we should try to... Uh, avoid that exposure to. Um, and when you think about toxins, it's, you know, I, I guess a lot of things in here, it's hard for us to like, uh, well, I mean, we can only, we don't have that much exposure to like, you know, diesel, you're not like around diesels all the time. 
um, exhaust and pollution, that's something that I guess you're, you're, not, you're not able to control. <laughs> you're, you're in a city unless you, you, know, you choose to go out and live in the country and then you're, you're avoiding a lot of the pollution in, in the air. Um, you know, some of the other things that I guess you can choose to buy, you know, um, buy things without, you know, without bottles, that, without containing BPA, um, you know, checking for lead exposure. Um, but what you can control is really the food, what you take inside your mouth. You know, those are the toxins that are really important to, to try and control. Um, and I just wanted to remind you that, you know, more than 100 years ago, or a little more than 100 years ago, maybe they, doctors were still uh, prescribing smoking as a way of treating, like, diseases like asthma, hay fever, you know, um, diseases of the throat and uh, head colds. I mean, it, it's, it's just, we think this is ridiculous because, like, how would you be describing that? Because like, we know how that, that, you know, tobacco is toxic these days, right? We, we know it's a strong association with cancer. But that didn't, come, that didn't come about until, like, the last recent decades. You know, in the, even back in the 1950s, they were still... Um, there's lots of people who were still smoking and they were still not, uh, they didn't even still think, think that it was a carcinogen back then. Um, and Ellen White told us through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that tobacco is a slow, insidious, but most malignant poison. In whatever form it, it is used, it tells upon this, uh, the constitution, it is all the more dangerous because its effects are slow and at first hardly perceptible. So it's like you you take a you smoke a cigarette, you're like, okay, it's fine, I'm not dying, you know, right? It's 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 not killing me. So why why how could it possibly be harmful to my health, right? Like she's saying, it's a slow insidious poison. So over time, that effect accumulates, and eventually you'll get diseases and die from it. And then, I think that could be said the same for uh, a lot of meat that we eat, like the meat and animal products that we eat the, in, in our day and age. Like we, the the evidence is accumulating to show that it is it is you know cancerous and toxic to our body, but you know because of industry uh, pushbacks the government and a lot of um, health organizations are not coming out to say we should be stop eating these things yet or doc even doctors themselves aren't even educated to stop eating things but you know the evidence is accumulating and i think the culture is slowly starting to change um, and here i want to show a quick video that talks about from nutritionfacts.org how much alcohol is safe you know a lot of you go to your doctor and a lot of your doctor will often say like you know limited alcohol uh, alcohol in moderation, you know, is it really safe? Uh, let's, let's see the evidence from Nutrition Facts. Recently, the IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the official World Health Organization body that decides what is and is not cancer causing, concluded that alcoholic beverages, all alcoholic beverages, are to be considered carcinogenic to humans. Most recent research has focused on acetaldehyde, the first and most toxic alcohol metabolite as a cancer-causing agent. Seems that bacteria in our mouths oxidize alcohol into this carcinogen called acetaldehyde, which we then swallow. There's convincing evidence that alcohol consumption increases the risk of breast cancer, you know, but most of the data derived from studies that focus on the effect of kind of moderate or high alcohol intakes, while little was known about light alcohol drinking, like up to like uh, a drink a day. Hence this new meta-analysis of studies that compared light drinkers to non-drinkers and found a moderate but significant association with breast cancer based on the results of more than 100 studies. They estimated that about 5,000 breast cancer deaths a year are attributable to light drinking, meaning nearly 5,000 women that died of breast cancer maybe wouldn't have if they just would have stayed away from alcohol completely, leading to an editorial in the medical journal Breast that concluded women who consume alcohol chronically have an increased risk for breast cancer that is dose-dependent but without threshold meaning there's apparently no level of alcohol consumption that doesn't raise breast cancer risk at least a little. So no safe threshold. Any uh, uh, level of alcohol consumption appears to increase the risk of developing an alcohol-related cancer. For example, the Harvard Nurses Health Study found that even consumption of less than a single drink per day may be associated with a modest increase in risk. 
forget a single drink. What about a single sip? A new study found that even holding a teaspoon of hard liquor in your mouth for five seconds and then spitting it out results in carcinogenic concentrations of acetaldehyde produced from the alcohol in the oral cavity instantly after a small sip of a strong alcoholic beverage. And the exposure continues for about 10 minutes after spitting it out. And you didn't even drink it. Even alcohol-containing mouthwash can give you a carcinogenic spike. The researchers conclude all in all, there's a rather low margin of safety in the use of alcohol-containing mouthwash. Typical use will uh, reach the concentration range above which adverse effects are to be expected. Until the establishment of a more solid scientific basis for a threshold level of acetaldehyde and saliva, prudent public health policy would recommend generally refraining from using alcohol in such products. So why isn't the same recommendation made for alcoholic beverages? Well, as the Harvard paper concludes, individuals will need to weigh the risks of light to moderate alcohol use on breast cancer development against the benefits for heart disease prevention to make the best personal choice regarding alcohol consumption. They're talking about the famous J-shaped curve. While smoking is bad and more smoking is worse and exercising is good and more exercising is better, for alcohol there appears to be this beneficial effect of small doses. A six pack a day increases overall mortality, but so does teetotaling. The number one killer of women isn't breast cancer, it's heart disease, and a drink a day reduces the risk of heart disease. Why just reduce the risk of heart disease though when you may nearly eliminate the risk of heart disease completely with a healthy diet. So a plant-based diet that excludes certain plant-based beverages may be the best for overall survival. So what he's saying is, you know, there is no level of alcohol is safe uh, in terms of cancer uh, promotion. Uh, prevention. Um, and, you know, even though there's some evidence out there that suggests, oh, you know, you could, uh, a limited alcohol could be a, a, a helpful for certain types of cancer, maybe. A lot of that comes from, like, you know, wine drinking. And the wine drink, the reason behind that is because wine comes from grapes and there is vital nutrients that we get from grapes. But why do you want to get yourself, you know, get uh, push yourself to getting be increasing your risk for heart disease or other types of diseases and cancers by drinking alcohol when you get the same fatal nutrients from eating grapes. You know, here's here's my rationale. Like, you know, you should be thinking about what is the beneficial aspect of it and, eat, and getting it from a healthy source and rather than getting it from a toxic source. Um, another thing that Ellen White tells us to do is really avoiding stimulants. Um, she, Ellen White was told by an angel from heaven in the autumn of 1848 and again in the spring of 1863 that drinking of coffee was deleterious to health and even life-threatening. Um, she wrote, all should bear a clear testimony against tea and coffee, never using them again. They are narcotics, injurious alike to the brain and to the other organs of the body. And she's really talking about caffeine here. Um, and in March of 12 of 1981, there was actually a, a, a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is actually one of the most prestigious journals out there, that uh, is basically an epidemiology study that um, done at Harvard University, uh, where they actually show that the predisposing cause of cancer if, uh, of, pan of the pancreas um, is actually coffee drinking. So this is a, an association, it's an epidemiological study, so it's not, we don't call it the strongest evidence, but it's, it's out there. And I think because, you know, the Holy Spirit inspires Ellen White to write this, we should take it seriously. And, you know, even though, and try and avoid all drinks that have caffeine in it, as well as sugar. Um, the other big source of toxins in our, you know, in our, uh, in, in our diet is actually fish. Um, the reason behind that is there's a process called biomagnification uh, where 
the um, there's a lot of uh, toxins in our ocean these days. You know, you know, from atomic bombing, from pe things that people throw in the ocean, it's just filled with toxins. And the fish who lives in it and drinks that water every day, can you imagine how much toxins they're taking? So all that toxin gets concentrated in in the fish shells, especially in their fat cells. And as fish, you know, as fish start drinking the water and eating the smaller fishes. This is this basically biomagnifies, it concentrates up the food chain. So the bigger fish you eat, the more toxin you have, um, the more toxic it is. And you know, think about humans who eat fish and as well as other animals who eat fish, that only basically increase that concentration of toxin even more. So this is another reason why we should be avoiding animal foods because they are just very toxic. So the next law is air. Um, in Genesis 1, 6, God, God said, that, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the, the waters from the water. So this, is, this firmament is really air that, that gives us oxygen. And oxygen is like, you know, if you know anything about biology, it's absolutely critical for living, for, for us to live. Um, and so we need to get fresh air as much as possible and breathing you know, taking, doing deep breathing is actually a way to, for you to detox through your lungs. Um, and as, you know, as you know these days, we live in an environment where there's, our air is very polluted from, you know, whether it's industry or from um, the cars that are driven, the millions of cars that are driven. I mean, we are very lucky that we live in a, Washington DC is not as polluted as some of these other cities out there because we have a lot of trees, but you know, we should try and think about um, going out to, to outside to where there's like uh, um, plantations, where there's trees and, and try and do deep breathing exercises to help uh, our bodies detox through our lungs. Um, and also consider about, you know, maybe growing, having, bringing some plants into your house to uh, make sure you have to create that fresh air or um, basically as much as possible, get fresh air <laughs> into your body and try deep breathing. Uh, and this is a deep breathing exercise that you could try and uh, do every day. The next important law is rest. Um, in Genesis 2-3, God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all work, which God had created and made. Um, and he, this is so important that he put it as, as one of the Ten Commands. It's the fourth commandment. He said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord, your God. In it you should do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, or your female servant, nor their cattle, nor your stranger who is, in it, who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rest of the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blesses Sabbath day and hallowed it. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about, like, you know, what is, there's actually scientific basis behind this. Like why we need to rest, you know, one day out of six, out of seven. Um, and in the same way, we also need to rest, we need to also need our have a daily rest. Um, so in humans, there is actually, uh, scientists have looked at this, there's gene expressions that they have looked at which happens in cycles. Um, and this cycle, this uh, gene expression seem, uh, can follow like a day and night cycle, so 24 hours, this is called a daily, uh, so what we call the circadian rhythm. Um, so um, biologically, our bodies are made to follow this daily 24-hour circadian rhythm. But there is also something called a circus septum rhythm, which is a seven-day rhythm. Um, so an example is here, they're looking at pH. Um, so you see these smaller bumps, those are the daily rhythm, but the bigger bumps here you see, those are seven-day rhythms. So every seven day, there is a, ch you know, your body changes be, be to, uh, based on the data that you're, you're actually following. Um, so this kind of, you know, further evidence to show that like we are made to actually take rest, you know, on a daily basis as well as on a weekly basis. Um, and why we need to be following God's law to take rest. Um, and the, some of the health benefits of rest includes, you know, it's a time for rejuvenation, for restoring your brain, restoring your body, or your, your, for your body to uh, repair. Uh, some of the damage that's been done during the day. Um, so it increases your energy, sharpens your concentration. Um, most importantly, it also improves your immune system, you know, in the, in the perspective of cancer. You, strengthening your immune system is very important. Um, and 
another very important reason why we need to get our rest is also of this uh, wonderful graph here that my husband has made. Actually, I should, I'm, I'm telling you that a number of these graphs my husband made, especially with the melatonin, um, that basically we get, um, when we, during the day, we actually get a surge of what's called uh, this cortisol. Cortisol is a stress hormone. And it, don't you feel stressed on your day? <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, and that increases, you know, during the day and it decreases at night. Um, and at nighttime is what surges is the melatonin, which I talked to you about earlier. You know, this is the most powerful antioxidant on earth. Um, and you make that at nighttime. And it, I think what's important to pay attention here is that that surge happens in the first half of the night, like more than half of it happens uh, before midnight. So if you're missing your sleep before midnight, you're missing a large part of your melatonin production. That's why a lot of times, uh, we, I don't know if you heard of this, but it, the first um, the hours of sleep that you get before midnight is equal to twice after midnight. So it's very important that you sleep according your, to your circadian rhythm, which is to go to sleep early, you know, around eight, nine, uh, late at latest 10, I would say. And if, you know, as much as possible, don't be a late after midnight sleeper. <laughs> um, because you're, you're hurting your melatonin production. Um, and some of the, you know, the benefits of melatonin is, includes anti-aging, it boosts your immune system, and it can help with migraines. Um, it's anti-cancer, antioxidant benefits, helps with depression, um, on and on and on. I think there's, there's a lot more benefits in this than I'm listing, but it's very important that we get our melatonin production from sleeping properly at night. In terms of how much sleep you need, um, this is a good diagram. It kind of depends your age. The, the younger you are, the more sleep you need. <laughs> and the older you are, the harder it is actually to get enough sleep. But, um, so, but generally, for most of us, it's seven to nine hours of sleep, at least seven hours of sleep for everybody here. Um, the last law is probably the most important law of all is trusting in God. Um, in Genesis 2.17, God said, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So that was a command that he gave Adam and Eve. And it requires us to trust him on that. You know, it, he just told them that, but how sh why should they believe? But, they, but like he said, when they didn't believe him on that, he, they died. And... You know, God told us in Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Um, and as well as Psalms 32, oh my God, I cried out to you and you heal me. So if we trust him and ask him to help us, he will heal us. Um, the I wanted to present a little bit of scientific evidence to support why, how this works, the mind-body connection here. Um, in science, when we, uh, off, when we test a drug, we often test also something called a fake drug called a placebo. And a lot of times when we, you know, the placebo group that is not getting the real drug, they also have some benefits as well. They, they're, they have some kind of, you know, you see some effect in addition to what the real drug effect is. And this little bit of effect is coming from the mind. They believe that it was the real drug that, you know, they, they were taking a drug, they didn't know it was a real drug, it was a fake drug, but because they believed that this was a drug that would, could heal them, they got some healing effects, you know. So, simply believing God can heal you, can help you heal as well. Um, there is also, I'm summarizing here, uh, studies that shows that religiosity promotes recovery from many illnesses. Religiosity is defined as, you know, a, a ch attending a church service, uh, private prayers, or having belief in a higher power to gain in control. And it's particularly important that this higher power is a power that actually loves you. Believe in a God that loves you versus a God that punishes you. Or, or um, it, Basically, having these features can help you promote uh, recover from heart attacks, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, surgery, hospitalizations, high blood pressure, stress, depression, the list goes on and on. So it's definitely helpful to, uh, you know, believe, to have faith in God as a healer. Um, I want to show a quick video here. This is coming from, um, uh, from actually Weimar. They created this video that talks about uh, how faith can heal, can heal, uh, heal people.
New brain scan research has shown that spiritual practices can actually improve memory and may even slow down the aging process itself. Dr. Andrew Newberg wrote a book entitled How God Changes Your Brain. Through extensive research and brain scans, he shows that spiritual practices are inherently good for our bodies, especially our brains. According to Newberg, both meditation and prayer play significant roles in strengthening important circuits in our brains, which make us more socially aware and alert, while reducing anxiety, depression, and neurological stress. Consider this. In our goal to live longer, does trust in divine power play a role? In a study entitled Religious Involvement and U.S. Adult Mortality, it was found that people who never attended religious activities exhibited close to two times the risk of death compared with those attending religious activities more than once a week. This amounts to a seven-year difference in life expectancy. In other words, the health benefits of regularly attending religious activities is comparable to not smoking. So does this mean having faith in God changes our brains and our bodies? Is it really a valid means of living happier, healthier, and longer lives? Well, for starters, different studies have shown a connection between a lack of religious service attendance and the likelihood of having respiratory disease, infectious disease, or diabetes. The health risks extend so far as having high blood pressure, depression, suicide, lung cancer, coronary heart disease, chronic obstructive lung disease, and hospital admissions. It is also more likely to become physically disabled and suffer from weaker immune systems. In contrast, regular church attendees were more likely to stop smoking, increase their physical activity, become more social, and stay married. It's all pretty startling, and you might be thinking, how does it all work? Well, organized religion usually provides a social support system that's been shown to improve overall health. In a study of cardiac surgery patients, people with low social support who did not depend on the religious faith for strength had a mortality rate that was 12 times higher than people who did have a strong religious support network to rely on. Many hear this and think, well, then it's the social support that boosts health, not God. It's a question that's been asked often enough that a study was conducted to examine it. The study followed 22 kibbutzim, which are essentially collective Jewish farming communities. For 16 years, the study compared 11 religious kibbutzim in Israel with 11 secular kibbutzim. The study carefully matched them to make them as statistically similar as possible. Yet, despite their statistical similarities, the results were striking. Nearly twice as many people in the secular community died during the study. Ever consider the phrase power of prayer? Academic studies show that prayer has beneficial health effects, particularly for the person who is doing the praying. Studies of petitionary prayer in which a person prays for his or her own health or peace of mind show tangible statistical results. Science backs up the benefit of praying for your own health, especially when it comes to mental health like clinical depression. So, does God change our brains? Or as our creator, does God know what makes us the most healthy? I believe that God wants to be in a relationship with us. When we allow him into our lives, our brains are turned on. Our bodies are made more efficient. Our immune systems are strengthened. Thinking becomes clearer. And, well, we feel great. In our goal to live longer, healthier lives, being rooted firmly in God and fellowshipping with like-minded believers, has been shown to be one of the most effective strategies. My suggestion? Consider stepping into your local church this weekend. It wouldn't hurt. Um, as he explained, that we, you know, we have evidence out there to support that believing in a higher power is very powerful for healing. Um, I also wanted to 
tell you about this book out there. It's called Healing Words. It's written by a doctor that really talks about, um, it actually describes a group of cancer patients who has, whose cancers have regressed spontaneously without ever undergoing treatment. And all these patients have given themselves totally to the will of God through prayers. So um, it is the prayers where one is surrendering, surrenders to God and asking to know his will rather than for a specific outcome that can bring miraculous healing. So I highly encourage um, you know, those of you who are struggling or fighting with cancer or helping someone fighting cancer to read this book to get insights about how to you know, better use um, our relationship with God to heal us. Um, and I also, I mean, I think building our spiritual life really is very personal and there's a lot of different things that we could do. Um, this is actually from Vibrant Life magazine. They, you know, they list a number of things that we could do to build a relationship with God, to care for others, and cultivate positive attitudes. And I think that all of that are very important things to do. But to make it simple, I think for this, for this law, I think what I always encourage people to do is two things. One is to pray. You know, pray for yourself, pray for others, and because that's the only way we, we continue to build a relationship with God. And two is to study His Word, study for, sign up for Bible studies, study, you know, by by yourself or with others. That is, you know, those two things will help us to continue to build our relationship with God and to, you know, rely on Him to heal us. So summarize: these are the eight laws, laws of health. Um, the acronym is New Start. Um, and basically, um, I would say the thing to do is for nutrition, eat a whole food plant-based diet. You should go and exercise. If you know the, the, the worse your diet is, the more you have to exercise. But, you know, if you eat a healthy diet, you just need to go out and walk regularly every tw like 20 to 30 minutes a day. Um, water intake is very important that we should be drinking uh, clean, healthy water um, at least half, the weight, half our weight in ounces. Um, we need to be getting sunshine and fresh air. I usually tell people, like, you know, you just go outside and walk 20 to 30 minutes a day and you knock three of these out. So exercise, sunshine, and fresh air. Um, temperance is just avoiding toxins like alcohol, tobacco, um, you know, animal foods, and uh, as well as uh, caffeine. Um, and also, I would say recreational drugs, too. Um, and getting our daily rest and our weekly rest. And the last, most importantly, trusting in God, you know, building a relationship with God. Um, and I just want to end with some resources that are out there. Um, this, this is a guy, a gentleman who's like, I think he got cancer in his 20, late 20s, early 30s, and he ended up surviving from his cancer. Um, I think he had like colorectal cancer. Um, and he has a very beautiful testimony and has a website of supporting people through fighting cancer with lifestyle changes. So I highly encourage you. I think he recently has a book out, so you can get his book and read it if you're interested. Um, as well as um, some resources from uh, PCRM. Um, this, is, this is actually free on their website if you wanted to download it. It's a, a food choices for cancer guide. Um, as well, this is a book that they're selling. It's a little thicker than this one. And they actually have a promotion right now. If you're interested, I, I can send you the promotion code. And I, I think one resource I also didn't list up there is also if you're interested in just submerging yourself in this late loss of health and in, in this healthy type of lifestyle, I also encourage you to go to like a lifestyle center such as uh, Yuchi Pines, Weimar, um, Wildwood. We actually have one that's about two hours away from here uh, called Heartland. Um, so it's very close by, and actually we have a student from, from there that used to, uh, well, he was attending, he, hasn't, he wasn't here, he's not here today. So um, I encourage you to learn about them and maybe sign up and try and just get yourself submerged in that type of lifestyle to see what's it like and how you can make those changes to uh, live that way.